Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Last week, we looked at how glorifying the Lord entails three fundamental principles that flow throughout God's word, being atonement, worship, and enjoyment. We saw that through the atonement of Jesus, man's sin has been removed and he has been placed in a right and restored relationship with God. And through faith in Christ and by grace, through faith in the blood of Jesus, a person can now acceptably worship God and enjoy him forever. This week, we're going to look at what took place just before Christ's transfiguration. This event reveals two wills, and I like to just, I think it ties right in with atonement. It ties right in with what it means to worship and what it means to enjoy God. You see, God's will and man's will are two different things. God's ways and man's ways are two different things. The apostle Peter had just confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah of God. And after this confession, Jesus then informed the disciples of what would soon be taking place. We picked this up in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 31. It says, and he, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Obviously, this plunged the disciples into confusion. They had just declared their faith in, in Jesus as being the Messiah and in the coming of his kingdom. Yet the king is now talking about being killed. Several times the apostle John records Jesus making reference to his being lifted up, which meant crucifixion. Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. If we had been there, I believe confusion would have filled our hearts and minds. We would have been alarmed, even terrified at these words. But Jesus did not leave any room to doubt the Father's will in this situation. Look at the recurring word. It's the word must. Must go to Jerusalem. Must suffer many things. Must be killed. That word must in the Greek means necessary or binding. To be something which should be done as a result of compulsion. Whether eternal, as a matter of duty, or external, law, custom, circumstance. It also means it is necessary. There is a need, it is right, it is proper. In our first point, Jesus was obeying the essential and obligatory will of God. It was essential, it was necessary, it was binding. And he had a compulsive passion for the will of God. Hence the title of this message, the compulsive passion for the will of God. And he was obeying. It was essential. This was a necessary established will of God, the counsel and decree of God, especially by that purpose of his, which relates to the salvation of men by the intervention of Christ and which is disclosed in the Old Testament prophecies. Why must he, G. Campbell Morgan says, these men would not have made him suffer and would not have killed him if he would have accommodated the standard of his teaching to their ideals. 
But in the mind of the king, there was the must of a tremendous conviction and an absolute loyalty to that conviction. As a man, Jesus set forth for all of us what it means to have a compulsive passion for the will of God and to live it out with tremendous conviction and absolute loyalty to that conviction. And it was his absolute loyalty to his convictions of the Father's will that he suffered and died. But the disciples would have none of this thinking. And the Apostle Peter was about to represent his hearts in, in the minds of the others with him concerning this matter. The sad thing was that the disciples did not understand the must, the necessary and binding will concerning the Lord, not only his death, but also his resurrection. I must rise on the third day. They weren't understanding that. This brings us to letter A. Peter spoke concerning the present at the expense of neglecting the past in the future. Peter spoke concerning the present, what was happening in his heart and in his mind, the confusion. No, you can't die. You're the Messiah. You're going to fix everything at the expense of neglecting the past prophecies and the future prophecies. Again, Mark 8, 32 through 33, and he, he spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. He rebuked him. He reproved him. Here, here's Jesus rebuking the Lord, and then the Lord turn around, turns around and rebukes Peter. It is probable that Peter was representing the collective thoughts of the whole group of disciples. He was the spokesman revealing the will of man. And I might say, not just the disciples, but all of us if we had been there. They were neglecting the past in that they were not understanding the prophecies from the law and the prophets concerning the Messiah's death. And they were also neglecting the future in that they were not understanding the prophecies concerning the Messiah's resurrection. Brings us to letter B. Peter had in mind the things of men because he refused the methods of God. Again, Peter had in mind the things of men because he refused the methods of God. God's plan for the defeat of Satan, sin, death, man's salvation, and eternal life would be through the death and resurrection of Jesus. The things of God are a stumbling block to the man who is minding the things of men. A man minding the things of men always finds the cross an offense, a stumbling block. Notice that even though Peter loved Jesus, he was not accepting the methods of God. Therefore, he became a stumbling block to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him, and Jesus knew what he was saying. And he looked right past, right through Peter, to the one that was whispering in Peter's ear, and he rebuked Satan. Those were words of the devil himself. Listen to this. Jesus turned and said to Peter, NIV says this, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You are a stumbling block. You are an offense, is what the Greek means. You're trying to entice me to sin, to trip me up. The word carries with it apostasy, to reject faith, to fall away from faith to put a stumbling block or an impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. And here's Peter just, just no, this is not going to happen, Jesus. You are not going to die. You're not going to be crucified. No way. It's not going to happen. Furthermore, Jesus takes this opportunity to teach about what it means to have in your mind the things of God. And it would be through his sacrifice that men would be able to enter into a relationship with God and have the mind of Christ. This means that man has now been given an invitation to commune with God through the sacrifice 
in the resurrection and the ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Brings us to point two, having a mind that possesses the things of God enables a person to engage in the commands of discipleship. Say this again, having a mind that possesses the things of God enables a person to engage in the commands of discipleship. In verse 30, 4a of chapter 8 in the book of Mark, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to him, whoever desires to come after me. The NIV translation states that the invitation to discipleship was even extended to the crowds. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must. He must. There is an urgency within the body of Christ to understand the seriousness of discipleship and what it entails. Notice the word must. The New Living Translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible, all use the word must. Stuart Weber says Jesus defined a true follower in three ways. All three verbs he used are third-person imperatives in the Greek language, for which there is no exact English translation. The closest we come to a proper translation is let him, but even this is not forceful enough. The words he must carries the force of the commands. It carries the force of the commands. And then he called the crowd, to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must. And this, this is a, a teaching of the commandments of Christ concerning discipleship. And the word must carries the force of the commands. And what's the command? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. The invitation to come after him, to follow after Jesus, was given some 24 times in Scripture. But we learn in this invitation to discipleship that it is much more than an invitation because, as letter A states right here, the first commands of discipleship are to utterly deny self. The first commands of discipleship are to utterly deny self. William McDonald says to deny self is not the same as self-denial. It means to yield to his control so completely that self has no rights whatsoever. You become a slave to God. To deny self is not the same as self-denial. It means to yield to his control so completely that self has no rights whatsoever. The verb used in the Greek means to deny utterly. This speaks of a conclusive denial. To denial oneself with this depth of denial is to live without self-centered thoughts. It means that you become wholeheartedly devoted to the teachings of our Lord. This does not mean that we are to inflict pain on ourselves or live in a state of depriving ourselves, but it means that we are willing to live and give our lives for the Lord no matter what the cost there would be no competition within the heart to dethrone the Lord, his will, or his purposes. Why? Because you understand you must deny yourself and follow him. You would possess or have in your mind the things of God. When you do not deny self, you don't have the things of God in your heart, in your mind. A Jewish proselyte was required to renounce their idolatry in false religion. It was on this ground that the Jews called a person to a new birth. We look in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. 
This was a determined, this was for Ruth, I must do this. I must leave Moab. I must denounce the gods that I have served. I must follow Naomi to Bethlehem. I must serve her God. I must love her people and be amongst her people. I must. She had a conviction and it ran deep. Jesus requires men to be born again. And we know that it's through repentance, through returning, through leaving, just like Ruth did, just like Abraham did. They had to leave their country, leave their past, leave the gods that they served, leave the old life, which is a renouncing of their former way of life. They were to turn from the things of men, the world's view, the world's wisdom, and the world's philosophies. You see, there's no truth when a person is enslaved to spiritual darkness. There's no truth. And to renounce self-dependence and self-pursuits and to turn to the Lord, to repent of sin, to leave that old way of life, unless that is an, a, a compulsive passion, we won't understand discipleship. But when we renounce self-dependence, when we renounce selfish pursuits, when we renounce sin, when we step out of spiritual darkness into the wonderful light, then we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a believer, we become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. When this happens, the test of loyalty then takes place. Letter B, for many believers in Christ, for many believers in Christ, suffering, shame, and separation is the cross that they carry. For many believers in Christ, suffering, shame, and separation is the cost, I'm sorry, is the cross that they carry. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. When a person was admitted into the Jewish religion as a proselyte, he would submit to the yoke of the Jewish law and bear patiently the inconveniences and sufferings with which a profession of the Mosaic religion might be accompanied. Jesus requires the same condition. Taking up the cross not only implies a bold profession of Christ crucified and risen again, but also a surrender and a submission to the sufferings and the persecutions, even martyrdom, they may accompany a profession of faith, especially in the New Testament church. And we know it to be true that these things are carried out today, as we have brothers and sisters in Christ that suffer tremendously tribulation and trial and persecution, and some are killed for their faith. For the disciples, except for John, all would experience martyrdom for Christ. And countless numbers of believers throughout history have been killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Furthermore, when a Jewish person became a Christian, as with many pagan idolaters who placed their faith in Christ, opposition became persecution and then public execution. In the book Hard Sayings of the Bible, it says a person on their way to public execution was compelled to abandon all earthly hopes and ambitions. At that time, the words of Jesus might have been rendered thus. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him be prepared to be led out to public execution, following my example. Denying oneself is not a matter of giving up something, whether for Lent or for, for the whole of life. It is a decisive saying no to oneself, to one's hopes and plans and ambitions, to one's likes and dislikes, to one's nearest and dearest, for the sake of Jesus 
Christ. And it brings us to letter C, the commands of Jesus, they reveal his deity. They reveal his deity. Listen to this. This is tough. Matthew 10, 34, 39. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is pretty strong. What's he talking about? He's talking about what takes place. When a person is all in with Jesus, it divides families. It can divide brothers, siblings. It can cause a person to be ostracized out of their family when they turn to Jesus. Luke 12, 49 and 53, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. From now on, five and one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. One of the highest duties in all Judaism was to love family members, especially parents. Every faithful Jewish person knew and understood that only God himself could demand a higher love. Oh, hear Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. We are not to put anything or anybody above that love. And in the person of Jesus, the Old Testament scripture has been fulfilled in part. He is the Messiah, the Christ of God. And Jesus claimed to be God and he was being worshipped as God. To an unbelieving Jew, such as the Apostle Paul, until his conversion, opposition to Christianity was at times extreme and severe. And now Jesus is declaring allegiance to his word and to his person. Therefore, it's been said to be Jesus' disciple might mean being misunderstood even by one's own family. Ultimately, his ministry would bring not peace but division because some would accept what he was saying and others would reject it. His ministry would be like a fire which devours. Jesus longed for the purpose of his ministry to be accomplished. His life and his death would be the basis for his judging Israel. And that judgment, like fire, would purify the nation. The baptism he spoke of, no doubt, referred to his death, which he said would be completed. Jesus' mission actually did result in the kind of family divisions of which he spoke here. Families have been divided and loyalties broken. Jewish believers are still ostracized from their family and friends. However, to be a disciple, one must be willing to undergo such problems. So we take up our cross, and that may mean for some to experience persecution. For some, it's death. Because we here in the West don't experience persecution like this. Our meaning of a cross that a person must carry is a lot different. With reservation and respect for the words of Jesus, our cross may mean health issues, financial issues, relationship issues, a wayward child, loss of a loved one, aging issues, dealing with the crisis of tragedy, of loss. To us, this is a cross. Whatever your cross may be, and in light of what we have just read, with reservation, we must deny ourselves and embrace the condition which God has appointed and bear the troubles and difficulties we meet and carry our cross with the eyes of our hearts focused upon Jesus. See, number three, in order to follow Jesus, we make the must of his life the must 
of our life. In order to follow Jesus with a whole heart, we make the must of his life the must of our life. I must go to Jerusalem. I must be killed. I must be raised up. I must be about my father's business. G. Campbell Morgan again. Jesus said, you take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. That is, make the must of my life the must of your life. I must. It does not mean suffering. It may or it may not. Suffering is not the deepest thing in the must. The deepest is this. I must cooperate with the purpose of God whatsoever it may be. The deepest thing is that we get in touch with God and do his will. And whether it be laughter or crying, sorrow or sighing, the secret of life is to follow him on the pathway of loyalty to the divine will. You see, our following Christ means that at all costs, with a, necess with a necessity and a binding loyalty, we follow him no matter what happens within our life. There's no other options but a sold-out allegiance to Jesus. John Spencer says, When Alexander the Great marched through Persia, his way was stopped with ice and snow, insomuch that his soldiers, being tired out with hard marches, were discouraged and would have gone no further, which he perceiving, he dismounted from his horse and went on through the midst of them, making himself away with a pickaxe. They then all being ashamed, first his friends, then the captains of his army, and last of all, the common soldier, they followed him. So should all men follow Jesus, their Savior, by that rough and unpleasant way of the cross that he has traversed before us. He having drunk unto them in the cup of his passion, then they are pledged to him when occasion is offered. He having left them an example of his suffering, they are to follow him in the self-same steps. In the self-same steps. Fanny Jane Crosby, who lived from 1820 to 1915, she was a gospel songwriter, musician, preacher, and evangelist. Born in Putnam County, New York, Crosby was blind from the age of six weeks due to a physician's mistreatment. Raised in a religious environment, she memorized scripture and poetry and was able to recite the first four books of both the Old and New Testament by age 10. Entering the New York School for the Blind in 1835, she went on to teach at the school from 1848 until her marriage to Alexander Van Alstein in 1858. She was known by the public as Mrs. Crosby for the rest of her life. Her first publication was The Blind Girl, and other poems in 1844, but she would eventually establish a style of poetry which still characterizes gospel songs and her prolific output of hymn texts made her familiar to an entire generation. Traveling, preaching, and witnessing brought her into contact with many Christian leaders and public figures. Her texts written in her own name were set to music by the most popular American tunesmiths of the century, including Ira D. Sankey, but she asked only about $2 for each hymn and deliberately lived a frugal life. The author index of any contemporary evangelical hymn is testimony to her, influ her influence. True hymns, she said, make themselves. I never undertake a hymn without first asking the good Lord to be my inspiration. Among her thousands of familiar hymns and gospel songs are all the way my Savior leads me. Blessed assurance, I am thine, O Lord. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Rescue the perishing. Tell me the story of Jesus, and to God be the glory. The collection of Crosby's papers are held at the Lincoln Center Music Division of the New York Public Library. Listen to the words of the hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort. 
here by faith in him to dwell. For I know, whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers, each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see all the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed and mortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus lead me all the way way. And this brings us to point number four. Spending your entire energy preserving yourself in this life keeps you from investing in eternity. Let me say this again. Spending your entire energy preserving yourself in this life, living for self, keeps you from investing in eternity. Matthew 16, 25 and 26 in the English Standard Version says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? Remember that Jesus was speaking to the misunderstanding of the disciples, but also for the benefit of the crowds and for us. Jesus declares that there is a cost to discipleship. And if anybody preaches anything different, they have the things of man in their heart, not the things of God. Jesus declares that there is a cost to discipleship. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Furthermore, if, if it were possible for an individual in preserving his own life to gain the whole world, but in the process lose his life, of what value then would be the possessions of of the world. The word in the Greek has been translated soul, person, the breath that is uh, that gives life, a living being, a living soul. Some translations of the Bible use soul and some use life. Adam Clark states, on what authority many have translated the word for soul, life, and in this verse, soul, I know not, but I'm certain it means life in both places. If a man should gain the whole world, its riches, honors, and pleasures, and loses his life, what would all this profit him, seeing they can only be enjoyed during this life? But if the words be applied to the soul, they show the difficulty, the necessity, and importance of salvation. The world, the devil, and a man's own heart are opposed to his salvation. Therefore, it is difficult. The soul was made for God and can never be united to him nor be happy till saved from sin. Therefore, it is necessary. He who is saved from his sin and united to God possesses the utmost felicity that the human soul can enjoy, either in this or the coming world. Therefore, this salvation is important. You see, Jesus was talking about saving one's life, but his focus was on life's fulfillment in eternity. His point was profound. If a disciple spent all his energy focusing on this life here and now, he would lose the entire point of his life, which is investing in the life to come. If a person does not accept the challenge of true discipleship, he will forfeit both true quality life now and a fuller reward in eternity. There are no gains if a person wastes his life on himself. And Jesus follows up by stating the following. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. So then the big question that we need to answer is, what are we living for? What are we living for? Last point. There are many people who believe in Jesus, but only follow him on their terms. Another way to look at this, many people say they'll serve God when things are going relatively well. But at the first sign of trouble, they back off. They disfellowship themselves with God and with others and then blame him for their misfortunes and resume having 
in mind the things of men. Is not this just another way of forfeiting your life? And yet there are ministries promoting a health and wealth gospel that falls far short of having the things of God in mind. When a person's life ends and they give an account, there is no price they can give for exchange for their life. In other words, if all they live for was self and being, being self-worth, self-preservation, self-promotion, self-dependence, self-sufficiency, not having in mind the things of God or his purposes or his leading or his plan for their life, eternity will judge them for their selfishness. And there will be no rewards. Listen. Jesus said, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So do you have in mind the things of man or the things of God? Are you trying to preserve your life or are you losing it for the sake of Christ? What is the treasure of your heart? Is it Jesus? Is it his teachings? Is it God's will and purpose for your life? Or are you only given bits and pieces of yourself to him? You see, the way we answer these questions determines, I believe, our life in eternity. So how does a person truly deny self, take up his cross and follow Jesus? The answer, with the same attitude that possessed Jesus, having in mind the things of God having that compulsive passion for the will of God. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy set before Jesus? The fulfillment of his mission, redeeming man and making all things new the fulfillment of his Father's will. May we all find ourselves glorifying God with our lives in the here and now so that we can enjoy him in the here and now and forever throughout eternity. May the must of Jesus' life, the compulsion and passion for the will of God, be the same for you and for me.